Yes, I'm Rob Lewis. Uh, I've uh, been an eco-warrior, a hidden eco-warrior for 50 years. I started out in the 1970s as a marine, a marine scientist working on lobsters and oceanography in South Australia. I've been fortunate, I've been able to extend that work around the world, places like Woods Hole, Scripps, uh, Canada, all over the world. Uh, as you can see from my, from my uh, introductory slide, uh, the area that has been my passion has been Southern Temperate Australia. It is um, a sustainable bioeconomic bio uh, uh, potential, but it is what I, I coined the phrase, the unique south. Someone mentioned earlier that uh, for Antarctica, a, a significant proportion of the species are endemic there. 80% of the endemic of the species, uh, many of the species across uh, uh, so the, the uh, southern uh, temperate Australia, uh, marine waters are, are endemic. I would like to give a presentation that cuts across almost every presentation here because they all gave very good me messages and signals, but I would like to put some of those into context of how we, how we actually understand the systems out there, how we inform um, uh, management of them, because it is a, a fact that if you've got a resource, someone wants to utilise it. And you go and how, you, how you allow that to happen is the issue. And to do that, you have to have, understand the systems, and they're very complex systems, and you have, to have, you have to be able to have evidence to be able to put restraints on people. Uh, the Southern Temperate Region of Australia is unique. 60 million years ago, it was attached to Antarctica. It's uh, our, bio, our marine bioregions in, South, in, in uh, Australia are some of the largest in the world. Uh, they're, they're, they've got mega biodiversity uh, bioregions. We've got 70,000 kilometres of uh, continental coastline and 8.6 million kilometres of continental marine territory, so that which we're covering. But the area I'm particularly interested in is southern temperate Australia. Um, this, uh, this area, Australia, cut off, split off from Antarctica 60 million plus years ago. And basically, as a result of that, basically our biota and our our biodiversity has to all intents and purposes been isolated and that's why we get so many diverse um, um, endemic species. The other thing about it is that there's only two sources really of new nutrients going into the oceans. One's been mentioned today, uh, I'll come back to that one. The other one is rivers, you know, but wearing, wearing down mountain ranges and putting nutrients into the, into the oceans. The other one is, uh, is upwellings when you, most of the life is in the photic zone and basically what happens is as, as they die, as organisms die, they sink, they de decompose and upwelling systems bring that up to the surface and that's, they're the source of, of, uh, of productivity in these areas. So uh, basically this, uh, so Australia doesn't have too many rivers. The largest river in Australia, the Murray-Darling Basin system, quite often is blocked off. So on the southern coastline of Australia, the sole source of nutrition really is, um, is upwelling. It shouldn't be there. You don't have upwellings on the on east-west coastlines, but at certain places you have uh, a north-west, north, north south-east coastline, and at some of the, in about October, November, and uh, the winds go southeast, so you get an upwelling system. In fact, I discovered that upwelling in, in the mid-70s, trying to understand how re -lock, rock lobsters reproduce. So, that was, uh, so, so that's uh, the excitement of discovery of a researcher. Um, it is, this region is very highly uh, comp complex. It has lewin current waters that come down, and that's why we get sunfishes off southern Australia sometimes, etc. But the major areas are the Flinders current and the seasonal upwelling. We do get a current which actually flows down from Port Augusta. You know, ba basically our gulfs are reverse estuaries. Almost every estuary in the world is the other way around, where the lowest, the, the highest salinity is at the seaward end. Our gulfs, the highest salinity is at the at the top of the gulf, and at the top of Gulf Saint uh, Spencer Gulf, we get something like five or six or seven feet of evaporation a year. 
you get very highly saline water sinks to the bottom. It's actually warmer than the water above it, and, uh, and, but it, cask it flows down un, on, uh, on, on, on the bottom, uh, out past Kangaroa and cascades out over the continental shelf. Uh, so understanding that is how the first thing you need to understand about what impacts the biota and the taxa and the biomass that lives out in, the, in these regions. And you can see that uh, the, the darker blue areas on the, e the eastern side of the Great Australian, or Great Australian Bight or the Air Peninsula, or the western side of the Air Peninsula, and particularly in the southeast, you can see that cold water, that dark blue cold water. That is the life nutrients of this system. And that, what that drives is high levels of endemism, significant uh, iconic megafauna and species and, and plants. There are over 1,100 al al uh, uh, macroalgal species along this coastline, uh, only matched by off uh, Monterey in, in the United States. So there's a lot of, lot of uh, diversity here. 80 percent, we've got 80 percent of the uh, Australian population have long-nosed fur seals and Australian sea lions. We've got the largest commercial fisheries in, in Australia, the sardine fishery. Uh, we've got 25 percent of Australia's seafood production in southern, southern temperate Australia and 25 percent of uh, the, uh, by, and that's by, va by value, uh, tonnage and by volume. We're, we've got ma marine parks of national significance. Uh, I was the presiding member that bought when marine parks were bought into South Australia. And uh, we operated on a car zone which was comprehensive, adequate and representative. In other words, we had to have a representation from every, from every major biotype, uh, but equally we had to have them of a large enough scale that they were effective. Uh, it's got it's a um, eco tourism hotspot, and as I said, we've got high bio um, um, bio prospectivity. So where you've got high bio prospectivity, people want to utilise it. I coined a phrase called uh, the convergence of conflict in the marine park debate, because the areas of where you've got high high um, bioprospectivity is also the most interesting areas and most important areas as far as environmental and sustainability and so you've got a clash of, 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 of uh, demand for that resource and that's the reality whether you're in Antarctica or anywhere in the world and you've got to have the, uh, the ability to manage that, that, con that convergence and that can only be done by having understanding the systems and having the evidence to actually um, have a rational uh, debate between the competing demands. Uh, again, just looking at the southern region here, you've got this regional hotspot. On the top line, you've got basically from the, the uh, introduction of the, the oceanography to the bringing the nutrients in, building the, uh, building the uh, ecosystems and, and the trophic the trophodynamic relationships uh, and, and the, the various biota, some are pelagic, some are, some are benthic, etc. And then on the bottom you've got uh, the, um, the really iconic species which are there. And the, the basic thing is an understanding, you know, my mantra is an understanding of the oceanographic and ecological processes that underpin production and food webs in the region is critical to ensure the continued exploitation of natural resources is ecolo ecologically sustainable. I once published, when I was head of the Department of Fisheries, which I was for about eight years, uh, I once published a strategic plan. All strategic plans say who the clients are. Uh, I normally ask people, who do you think I put down? I'll, I'll cut, cut across that. I put down our clients for the fish because if you look after the fish, you look after the fishermen. And that was the basis. And if you, got, if you don't have any fish, you're not going to have any fishermen, you're not going to have any, bio, you take it to the wider biota, you're not going to have any biota, etc. Uh, I'm always intrigued when we talk about whaling in this country, uh, because I normally put these up as 
the quote and then say who said that, but I haven't got time to do that now. Um, there's a quote that says, the supply of the fish in the ocean may be considered to be practically inexhaustible. That was actually, on my, on, in my office, I've got the first edition of Mrs Beaton's book of household management. That was the first line of the chapter on fish. Now, she may not be as definitive enough for you or authoritative enough for this audience to, to say that. So the next line is, the next quote I've got there is, all the great sea fisheries are inexhaustible. That is to say they have nothing we do seriously affects the numbers of, any, of fish. Any attempts to regulate this uh, fisheries seems useless. That was said by Thomas Henry Huxley, the, the great defender of Charles Darwin. That was the knowledge base back in those days. And when those fishermen there killing whales, which we, I, don't, I condemn, but I understand as well. They were putting oil, lighting Europe and things like these on, on that knowledge base. Part of my message today, we, this current generation, cannot, cannot, is no longer uh, lacking knowledge or information and we have to act, you know, and uh, I don't want when, I used to say when I was director of fisheries, I don't want my grandchildren uh, condemning me like we condemn the uh, whalers of a hundred years ago uh, for not acting because I have no excuse now because I know that we can impact these systems, etc. I just put the other two there to show that uh, even smart people in the modern world can make mistakes, you know. I think there's world market maybe for five computers that was the head of IBM once and, uh, and also um, 64K ought to be enough for anybody. That was said by Bill Gates. So, so. Um, the, the, the basic fundamentals of a, bio, a blue bioeconomy, a sustainable blue bioeconomy, are finite biological renewable resources. And the rate, the definition of a renewal is the rate at which you extract them versus the rate at which you, it replaces itself. Oil is a renewable resource. If you extract one barrel of oil a year from, uh, and your, 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 return, your rate of renewal is over a million years. But that doesn't fit with our economic and uh, social type timeline. So, so it, you have to take those into account. But that's what I, these are, every resource is finite, no matter what it is. But some of them, particularly biological ones, are renewable. A geriatric prawn is three years of age. A geriatric lobster is 30 years of age. A geriatric uh, orange ruffy is 160 years of age. So you need to take those things into consideration. Uh, an orange ruffy doesn't start reproducing until it's, si till it's 60 years of age. Um, it's commonly accepted and legislated that they're common property resources. In other words, they're owned by you and current and future generations. Those resources, the people who exploit them, fishermen, don't own the stock. They own a right to fish that stock. It's called a profit a prende. Uh, and basically the government of the day are the custodians through legislation of managing that stock and people like myself are the agents of, in my previous life before I became a grumpy old retired man. Um, uh, uh, they're, they're, we're the agents who do that for future and current generations. That's why you put out a strategic plan that says that our, that our clients are the fish. Um, you also have to understand the, the biology and the reproduction. The lower vertebrates, like ourselves, and, and, and so, so the, the higher vertebrates, like ourselves, etc., we, we have what we call a low fecundity. We produce a few offspring, but we give them, uh, you know, all, all high vertebrates, give them reasonable parental care until they can defend, have a good chance of defending themselves when they leave their parental care. In the lower invertebrates and the, all the invertebrates in the sea, the adaptive strategy for survival is completely opposite. They produce mass massive numbers of offspring. A single rock lobster produces somewhere between 750,000 to a million eggs and larvae every time it reproduces, and that would be from the age of five to the age of 30. Uh, only two have to survive, and probably only about 10 do. 
because those, those larval stages, uh, most where, it was where most of the mortality is. Um, as, so you need to understand the dynamics of these, these whole, I, I, the, every individual species, but the system as a whole. And so, the, so the, what we've done, and this is just one example of a project which we put together, was called the Great Australian Bite Research Program, where, I won't go into detail, but basically it looks at all the various elements so that you understand not just the individual species and uh, assemblages that, you, that you're impacting on, but the systems to which they operate within. And you can see there we've got an oceanographic theme, we've got a benthic theme, which is anything that, that lives on the, on the bottom of the ocean, on the, on the substrate, pelagic, uh, an ecosystem uh, theme, that's everything from viruses and bacteria to whales and everything in between, taxa in between. We've also got, uh, like we had a program on iconic species and apex predators and socioeconomics and also petroleum geology and geochemistry if people want to start drilling out there. So we need to know something about it. And then the, the most important part is theme seven, where we put all that together into an integrated model, which is about where you could do scenario planning when you had competing demands on, each, on, on, these, on these resources. Because that way, this is the only way you're going to get rational debate about how you're going to manage these resources because otherwise you don't have the information, you, can, you won't be able to, you won't be able to uh, ask, uh, uh, put your case rationally, and it'll come down to what I call megaphone posturing, by who can shout the loudest and, and get the most media or, or what they do. We also, I won't go, I haven't got time to go, so we also have a thing called the Integrated Marine Observing System, which uh, when I discovered the upwelling in here, I did it by hand, going out and taking water samples and on a boat, etc. Now we've got uh, all instrumentation out there in the ocean. We've got ocean sentinels out there. Uh, you know, I had technical assistance. You had to feed them. They were grumpy. They wanted to sleep. Uh, these, we've got uh, instrumentation on all these all these organisms on, on little penguins, short shear waters, crested terns, on sea lions, sharks out there, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, sending us data on, on uh, what, what took me three years, now takes about three months to get those data, you can see some of the, some of the data there, etc. There's been three generations of marine bioresource utilisation. The first one started in reality in, uh, well, it started in time in memoriam, but modern fisheries management was in the late 50s, early 60s, when we went from that, some people will say ignorance, but knowledge base of Mrs. Beaton and T.H. Huxley, we started to realise that we actually had evidence and we had to manage, start managing that. And modern fisheries management started in the 1960s. And I was fortunate enough to be... Uh, the legacy, to, to build on the legacy of some of those pioneers. Um, and so we brought in, that, and someone mentioned, so the basics are you need to know where, what the stock is, so you've got to do the taxonomy, and you, can, and you don't know where the substocks are. You need to know how much you can take to make that renewable equation. If you take too much, it'll go off. But you don't see a decline you don't see a decline in, we well, used to think called catch per unit effort as an indicator of abundance, but you don't actually see it decline over that when you've got these things which, which are basically producing so much surplus yield as, as offspring. You actually, see, as you fish them down, it's like walking to the edge of the table and then it just suddenly goes off the table. So you have to have an alternative way and we have, our, we have to have at least two or three ways of, of, of assessing stock and see how, if they, if they all match up, then you've got some a high degree of confidence in it. And that, that for that, you then determine what is the total allowable catch. In other words, how many dead fish can you take out of that population? Uh, then you have to allocate it, an ITQ, uh, in, a, in a, a quota, and then you uh, make an individual quota. So um, the previous session was about hunters turning to harvesters. Um, that's exactly what happened before modern fisheries management and for a while afterwards, until you got enough evidence to have a TAC be able to allocate, they're all competitive hunters. 
basically driven by ego, uh, who can get the greatest catch. They really didn't care about too much about the quality, etc. They just wanted to go out and get the catch. Same with farmers when they want to grow wheat. They, they, they go for yield rather than going for quality. So, so basically, but once you've got the evidence, you can, then, you can then change it over so that they become, they're guaranteed a share of the catch and they can fish when, they, when it's most appropriate for them and also uh, when they can optimise their profitability. I won't go into that one. That's the playbook about how, how I've summarises what I've done. I just want to point something out about seafood. And so the first generation was fishing. Uh, in most production systems, crops, etc., the more you transform it, the, the more value. Seafood is the opposite. The less you transform it, you get the highest value for. If you sit in the Swiggy fish market in Tokyo uh, and for, for a week and look at it, you, any fish that goes past your eyes smaller than that uh, and it's not alive, it'll harvest price. So you basically, it, it's a very, so you're looking, you're not looking at having a commodity, you're looking at having, in, in industrial fishing, uh, you're not looking at having a commodity, you're looking at having, having a premium product. The second area, which I won't go into, but the, the second generation, uh, 20 years later, yeah, very quickly, was, uh, was, um, but it was aquaculture, Decade has covered that. The third one is actually marine bioprocesses, which is happening right now. We we're not interested in the, in the whole animal, we're interested in all the bioactive compounds, the saccharins, the oligosaccharides, the proteins, the, the oils, etc., and turn them into a whole range of, in, of uh, health, industrial, environmental products, including uh, uh, um, uh, non-plastic non packaging, etc. By biodegradable packaging and, and as alternatives for, for, uh, for um, uh, plastics. Um, I'd just like to finish with two, two observations, uh, if I may. Um, one at the beginning of my life, and we've heard about we want to bring about change. We have to have change. We, you know, we, have to, we now recognise the challenges before us. Uh, the first thing is how do you bring about change in people that you want to change? When I was in my first job working on lobsters, I was evangelical, going to industry meetings, fishermen's meetings, and telling them about the biology of lobsters or the ocean upwellings, etc. I realised that each time, only 10% was absorbed, and you've got to be repetitive. You've got to go there. Um, and then they would just sit there and listen. And then after a couple of years, change takes time. After a couple of years, they'd say, oh, Rob, Rob they'd get up at me and say, Rob Lewis says this. They'd never be able to get it wrong. Two years later, they'd, be, they'd say, they'd, they'd start dropping the Rob Lewis, because I've been there another 10 times, uh, and then they'd drop the Rob Lewis, and they got it half right. By the time they finished, they could have gone to any university and given a lecture that would shame any academic on ocean upwellings in the southeast, etc. So you've got to not remonstrate with them or lecture to them. You've got to educate them. If you want people to change, you've got to educate them. The, the final one is change itself is a very interesting thing. Everybody in society, ourselves, me, we demand change. We've all got, we all got the technology, etc. If you break, we, if we go to McDonald's and it takes four minutes to get a, to get a hamburger, we want it quickly. This is a fast food restaurant. We demand change subliminally or, or, or directly. And there's been a lot of demand for change here. When you break that society up into individuals, those which are in, uh, directly or peripherally infected, affected by it, they find change stressful. They find, many of them will push back on it. But you put that same society together, so that the same number of people together into a society, that is the collective society, which is collectively demanding change. So we need to, I understand everything that's been said before, but we need to make sure that we are not remonstrating or lecturing, we're educating and understand the psychology of change. Thank you very much. 
Uh, thanks very much, Rob. Um, yeah, very interesting. And uh, the complexity of, um, of having science inform policy and management is quite a task. And, uh, and you've got some terrific, uh, or given us some terrific insights from your uh, wealth of experience.